thank you so much. Appreciate the introduction, and uh, real happy to be here with you all today. Um, so it's a, a privilege to come out and speak at Google and share my story, and I uh, look forward to giving you an overview of what motivates me to start this company and how I try to make a difference in all that I do here through this company, Purple Carrot, and I uh, look forward to uh, our discussion. So I thought I'd start off today with an image of our four kids. Uh, it's not necessarily to ask you to ooh and ah how cute they are, though I do think they're pretty cute. I'm a little biased as their father. Uh, but you know, these guys really give me a ton of motivation and inspiration to succeed and make a difference in the world. And I think about the world that they're going to inherit, and quite frankly, the world that each of us is going to be inheriting in the years ahead. And it's pretty scary to think about what's happening right now. Uh, I see myself as an optimist. I'm usually a half full kind of guy. But when you look out and you read the news stories and you see some of the data, uh, it's enough to give you pause about what our future looks like. And there's some people that might say it's even too late to make some meaningful changes that could alter the trajectory of uh, the way our planet is headed. But I'd like to believe that if we start acting together in a meaningful and deliberate way, there's a good chance that we can change uh, the course of our future. Uh, I want to think about creating a great world for these kids to grow up in, and so uh, this is my story. So I'm borrowing an image that uh, was re I was reminded by from Leonardo DiCaprio when he was um, serving as the uh, host of a new film that came out a few months ago called Before the Flood. I'm not sure if any of you have seen that, but uh, this picture really resonated with me. I was an art history major in college many years ago, and uh, this is a uh, image called The Garden of Earthly Delights by Euronymous Bosch. It was made about 600 years ago, and it's uh, never been more timely to take a look at this. So uh, it's a very large triptych. If we take a look at the first uh, leftmost uh, part of the painting, you see it's a really nice idyllic setting. There's plenty of light. There's not many people. It's not overcrowded. Uh, people seem pretty happy. It's relaxed. It's open. It feels pretty nice. As we shift into the middle, panel of the triptych, you start to see things changing a bit. There's a lot of overcrowding. There's a ton of people. There's some partying. There's sex. There's drinking. People are having a great time. And uh, it starts to take a shift from the earlier stages that uh, we saw in that image uh, into something that starts to get a little bit more like overcrowding and the situation that we might be living in today. And then at the end, as we head to the far right part of the image, uh, you see it's really decidedly very dark. There's death, there's destruction, there's fires. Uh, there's a lot of concerning elements to this image. I, I think I can see an image of Donald Trump in the bottom right corner there. And it's just uh, a scary view of what might be happening in our future. And uh, for a guy that painted this more than 600 years ago, it's worth taking note to think about uh, what this could mean for all of us in our future. So as I, uh, as you may have heard in the opening, I spent a lot of my life in the pharmaceutical industry, about 20 years promoting the value of Western medicine, and uh, still strongly believe in the value that uh, the drugs that are created in this country are great and can be life-changing and life-saving. But with all those uh, medicines that are available to us today and all the awareness that is happening in our country, there's still some pretty scary statistics that are worth pointing out. For starters, 70% of us are overweight or obese. And that's just a shocking uh, stat to see um, the way people are consuming food and the way they exercise or don't exercise to be in that type of situation. One in three of us are gonna die of heart disease and that actually makes heart disease America's number one killer and largely driven by the food choice that we make. And on top of that, 50% of us are gonna be diabetic or pre-diabetic by 2030. And these are three health conditions that are all chronic in nature and that all can be reduced or reversed by incorporating a plant-based diet. But I think if we continue to eat the sugary, yummy donuts and fried chicken and other things that are bringing a lot of uh, health issues upon us, things are not gonna change. Environmentally, it's not much better when you look out and you think about 50% of our land is currently allocated to animal agriculture. And to me, that just feels like an incredibly inefficient use of our land. And it's you know, our choice to continue to raise cattle that is 
only raised for slaughter, largely raised for slaughter, to feed our massive consumption of meat and of dairy uh, and these sort of oversized, uh, supersized type of appetites that people have developed. Now, if you're a farmer and you were fortunate enough to have an acre of land to work with, and you decided, well, what should I do with that acre of land? And you said, heck, I'm going to raise cattle. Well, you can think about how a farmer is going to think about that product and how they could use that uh, animal to make a profit and sell uh, food into the marketplace and the way they could use that product. And if you're efficient with that cattle usage and that way you raise that cattle, you probably can get about 375 pounds of beef that you're able to sell in the marketplace. If you think about that same acre of land, you can get 37,500 pounds of plant-based food from the same space. So if you stop and think about the amount of hunger that is pervasive across this world and the growth of our population to be north of 9 billion people in 2050, we got to think about how we could change the way we consume food, how we produce food, and the food choices that we make that could be uh, redeploying some of our land and our precious resources to feed those who are so hungry and so in need. From a water consumption perspective, the meat and dairy industry is associated with the use of about one third of all the fresh water on our planet. So if you just stop and think about how much water is required to raise cattle to uh, continue to sort of move that uh, process through the system, it's taking up a tremendous amount of very limited resource. And coming out here to California, I think about that even more as the city, this uh, state rather, has experienced a tremendous drought over the last five years. Things seem to be getting a little bit better but not a whole lot, and it's a concerning statement to think about how water is being allocated when it could be used in a far different way. Building on that, the uh, headline from uh, January this year was that the Earth hit a temperature record for the third year in a row, and that talks about how we're going this you know, incredible change in our environment that is considered to be unsustainable by most scientists, though some would tell you that it's uh, fake news. I would beg to disagree. Uh, Arctic sea ice hit a record low in the North Pole just a couple of months ago, and that's certainly clearly uh, driven off of the global warming issues. And just last week, there was a massive iceberg that broke off of the coast of Antarctica, and it's just you know more bad news after more bad news. So again, I'm not trying to paint such a miserable picture of the, of the world and what's happening, but it really points to some issues that we have. Uh, and a lot of those problems uh, with respect to the environment come off of this incredible uh, use of greenhouse gases or the emission of greenhouse gases, and about 18% of that is associated with agricultural farming. And so that type of practice is only causing uh, greater um, problems in our environment, and uh, that trumps all of the um, transportation emissions that people seem to associate with global warming, but animal agriculture is the number one culprit of that. So when you think about all that data that I just shared with you, it's probably not hard to look back at this, uh, this image again of the Garden of Earthly Delights and think about this image there on the far right is not too far off from where we could be headed if we don't make some changes. And it was really for that reason that I decided to start my own company three years ago called The Purple Carrot. The Purple Carrot is the only 100% plant-based meal kit on the market, and we provide all of the raw pre-measured ingredients that people need to cook three meals every week that are exclusively plant-based. Our whole mission is that we want to get people to eat more plants, largely for the reasons that I described, and we think that there's a bright future in that, and that we need to help more and more people start to think about eating more plants as a common way of life. It's a little bit of a weird statement to think about eating plants. I've never loved the term plant-based because I feel like most of us don't go out there and think about, you know, God, I can't wait to have some plants today. It's not really a crave-worthy uh, way of thinking about it, but uh, there's a lot um, to that that we can try to uncover. Uh, it's awesome that here at Google, uh, Eric Schmidt made uh, some predictions and comments about some of the most important tech trends that are out there. And the first one that he commented on was nerds over cattle, which is the idea of using technology to drive the greater use of uh, plant-based foods and meat alternatives. And it's uh, great that he was so far ahead of the curve to be recommending that as a material uh, way we can improve the environment. And just saw yesterday uh, this article in Fast Company about your quest to develop a plant-based power dish more popular than meat. So I'm not sure if you are even aware of this as employees that uh, there's been some adjustments to the amount of meat content in the burgers and it's moving into some more uh, mushrooms uh, without uh, calling that out to see if people still enjoy it as much. So 
uh, no matter the way you're approaching getting to a plant-based world, certainly here at Google, it's nice to see that being uh, so well embraced. So it's a big misconception that purple carrot is just for vegans. Uh, when I started the company almost three years ago, I always said this was vegan food for non-vegans. And I'm really thrilled to see that, as our data represents, 82% of our customer base are omnivorous. And we uh, have welcome surveys when people sign up to subscribe to our, our service. And they tell us what their meal, uh, their dietary choices and preferences are. And so the fact that four out of five of them continue to eat sort of a full omnivorous diet is very encouraging because I think that's where the market is, that's where the opportunities to change people's habits uh, exist, and we're excited to be doing our part to help move them along. Uh, we even created a word to characterize who our customers are, uh, someone who is what we call a balanceitarian. And this is a word we coined back in November of last year. And the idea is that it's someone who still can embrace a plant-based diet but doesn't totally divorce themselves from eating meat, some dairy, and some eggs. I think it's fair to recognize that it's really hard to be a vegan. Uh, I'm not a vegan. I eat a lot of plant-based foods, but um, you know the draw for dairy and some animal protein is pretty pronounced and sort of deep-seated in our, our evolution as human beings. And for those who are vegan and who stick with a vegan diet, I think it's largely driven from ethical beliefs and I really admire people who have the ability to uh, let that limit their food choices. But for the majority of people out there, it's really hard to stick with a diet uh, of any type, really. Um, and vegan is ex extremely limited in choices. There's certainly a lot more today than there ever has been. But our goal is to try to move people along a continuum that almost looks at us as sort of a gateway drug of sorts, that the more you start craving and enjoying plant-based meals, the less and less you're going to start to want to eat animal protein the less you'll want to have dairy, and the more mindful you'll be about the food choices that you, uh, you continue to make. So you can proudly say you are a balanceitarian. So the trends are certainly with us. This is, I thought, a pretty cool chart worth sharing. It was a, um, an image I captured from Google Trends, and uh, all the bright people at this company have this uh, novel tool that allows guys like me to log in and type in the word plant-based and see the trends over the last five years. And it's pretty amazing to look over here and see this type of, of spike in the last few months around plant-based. So it gives us a lot of hope and confidence that we're making a difference and getting on people's radar screen as uh, the general consciousness is increasing about the importance and value of plant-based eating. So I thought it might be worth just taking a moment or two talking a bit more about the category. Um, I'm not sure by a show of hands how many people have, uh, have or use a meal kit. Uh, so you get the idea. Um, it was started by uh, Matt, um, who launched Blue Apron back in 2012, and uh, Nick from Plated uh, was at Harvard with him as well, and the two of those guys started similar companies, Blue Apron and Plated, right around the same time. And Blue Apron has really run away with sort of the dominant uh, brand in the meal kit category. HelloFresh came over from Europe, which is where the whole concept started. And those three companies sort of began the process about five years ago, and it's amazing to think that this industry is only five years old. The idea is that consumers can subscribe to these services, and they are shipped all of the raw pre-measured ingredients in little baggies or uh, bottles and containers that uh, really should make it a lot easier for people to cook at home every week. Uh, you know, my wife and I would always talk in, in the morning, be sitting there having breakfast, and. She might turn to me and say, honey, what are we having for dinner tonight? And even though I started this company three years ago, I still get that question a lot. But uh, it's made a little bit simpler thinking about you know, maybe the choices are, well, which purple carrot meals uh, do we have in our refrigerator this week? So uh, the idea is that it's really intended to make it easier for people to cook. They all come with these colorful recipe cards that explain step-by-step -step instructions with the before and after shots of what you're looking to create. Uh, provide sort of a curated experience of meals that all tend to go together in that particular week. Uh, they can align specific to dietary needs or dietary preferences uh, that you might have. And it's a lot of fun. It's a nice way to learn how to cook. And I think there's a lot of millennials who are also um, not as informed about how to cook as some of the older generations and look for guidance. And meal kits do a great job of providing that training and sort of tutorial experience. So from a business perspective, though, it's really become a very dynamic category. Uh, what you see here on the screen are a couple of images about the different meal kit uh, delivery companies in the food tech space and the growth uh, from largely driven off of this part of the 
country or in Silicon Valley, the massive uh, influx of cash and capital into the food tech space. Food was sort of considered the new tech uh, from a few years ago, and a lot of money has rushed in. A lot of it has been focused around the immediate delivery, and I think that those of you here can attest to the commonality of on-demand, everything being here in 10 or 15 minutes, and just that incredible mindset that is really dominant here in this part of the country um, that may be less pronounced in other places that are certainly far less um, concentrated with the population. And a lot of hope has been placed on these uh, rapid delivery options that companies, but a lot of them are starting to fail or have been failing uh, if they're not closed down already on these um, sort of VC dreams of where and how fast uh, there can be disruption in the, in the marketplace. The category around food tech has just exploded though, and you can see from this image the incredible amount of logos and brands and players that are all trying to pursue and make a bit of a difference and find their spot with their own offering somewhere around the way people consume food. Uh, as a frame of reference, the grocery business is about a $800 billion category. The meal kit category is far smaller at about $5 billion with a lot of uh, room for growth, certainly. But the way people consume food and how frequently they do it is a big um, reason for a lot of these companies coming into play to try to disrupt the space. Uh, from a meal kit perspective, I'm really honored to see our name in sort of a pretty short list of companies that are considered leaders in the category. Um, what I show you here, are what I would consider the, the leaders, I probably would add Sun Basket maybe at this point, maybe in, instead of Peach Dish. Um, but there's a relatively small grouping now of companies who I think have found their niche, who are doing well, who are growing. Uh, and where I guess I would look at this is that Purple Carrot stands out as the only one that offers 100% plant-based meals. The rest of them really are focusing on pretty much the same type of offering. It's not to disparage those offerings. They're all great, but I think that it leads to so much more competition for the same type of consumer who is looking to acquire, who the companies are looking to acquire as subscribers and offering a pretty identical offering from any of these. And given the substantial venture capital investment that these, that these companies have received, they're able to use those dollars to offer free trials and you know, first box free or 50% off these orders. And it creates a pretty promiscuous user base where you can game the system, you can try any one of these companies, including ours, uh, and shift you know, each different week and get discounts. Ours, we don't discount ours much kind of for that reason. Uh, we don't want to play that game, but there's a big, big um, shift of the way people are thinking about how they consume meals and the category is growing. I think it's a pretty exciting space to be in, and it's an honor to be in this uh, short list. Now, there is a new player in the category that just came out a couple of weeks ago. You might have heard of this company. They're called Amazon. Uh, it's a little bit scary when you know being in this space, you see a name like that announcing that they're entering the category. Uh, you know, Jeff Bezos and team are a pretty dominant force in what they want to do and disrupt. You've got to give them a lot of respect and belief that they can do whatever they really want to do, given their infrastructure, their knowledge, their financial capabilities, supply chain control, uh, reach, consumer engagement, the list goes on. So, you know, seeing that, it was both like, oh no, great, and then great, oh no. You know, that's sort of happening that in the same moment when I saw that news, but uh, they're now into the mix with uh, a meal gets their own. So we'll see, I think they're still pretty much in a beta phase, offering it to a limited number of people in the Seattle area f through HelloFresh, but, uh, and through uh, Amazon Fresh rather, but um, it probably won't be long before they become um, slightly more involved in this category. They even filed a uh, trademark to do meal kits, and that has been a bit of a pain point for Blue Apron, which, um, went public just at the end of June, right around the same time this is happening. So it's pretty current information that I'm sharing here. And you know, it does make me wonder if Matt Salzberg did something to piss off Jeff Bezos, because it's, it's shocking to see the, the timing, and I feel a little bad for him. But you know, they, when uh, they launched their IPO at $10 a share just at the end of June, it's now trading around 675 or so. And it's really been under pressure, largely from uh, Amazon's decision to uh, move into the meal kit space. Uh, they've really been um, sort of battered down by uh, the news that Amazon is doing that. They're also, of course, uh, 
further hurt by the fact that Amazon's also announced that they are buying Whole Foods Market for almost $14 billion. Uh, and the timing of those two announcements came right after the other, uh, one before the other, actually, and that's been a big problem for Blue Apron as Amazon sits out there as a big competitor in the space. It certainly is competitive uh, to me at Purple Carrot in our business. Um, so interesting times. Uh, I thought it was worth sharing this image that I found that was incredible to see in as much as you see how they negatively impacted Blue Apron and their recent IPO and their stock price, how as soon as Amazon announced the acquisition of Whole Foods, what it did to the grocery category, to see Walmart, Kroger, Target, and Costco get totally pummeled. Uh, the only one that went up, of course, was Whole Foods uh, through that acquisition. Um, I believe that also Amazon announced they're moving into replacing a geek squad uh, that Best Buy, Best Buy offers traditionally, and Best Buy had the similar type of negative impact. So Amazon's a really substantial player in the category, um, and probably other than Google as a sort of dominant player out there, uh, you have to give them a lot of respect for what they can do. So it sort of feels like this is the moment where I'm that little guy in the diaper, practically, and you know, facing up against this uh, really strong competitor to think, how in God's name am I going to be able to compete with these huge players? And it is, um, it's really been a challenge, I think, since I launched the company, where I wasn't a food guy, I was not a VC. Um, I'd come from a 20-year history in the pharmaceutical world, and I think people thought, you're launching a vegan product. There's a very small percentage of vegans out there. I think, depending on what study you, you believe, it's anywhere from 2 to 6% of the population. And people said, Andy, why doesn't, people, why doesn't Blue Apron just go do their own vegan line? And it was really hard to get out there. So I'm proud of the fact that here we are almost three years later, uh, a part of the national conversation around meal kits, but it's only going to get harder and more competitive. And so I'll spend the last couple minutes talking about what I see as uh, part of our ways to succeed. So the guy on the screen here, you may know him, his uh, name is Guy Kawasaki. Uh, guy is an incredible thinker. Uh, he's a now venture capitalist. He was most well known, I think, for being the first evangelist at Apple computers. And now probably 30 plus years ago, Guy was out there evangelizing Apple to, uh, to schools to get Apple computer to be known. And it was a you know, very little known company back then. And Guy was uh, this very innovative thinker. And he has uh, evolved into the world of VC. And he wrote a book called Art of the Start. And I read that book back in the uh, end of 2006, actually. And it's always stayed with me and um, some great things. So if anyone's in here thinking about starting their own company, I'd highly recommend you take a look at this book, Art of the Start. And the first thing that Guy talks about in there is this idea that he says, make meaning. It's different from make money. Uh, and while he is a venture capitalist and thinks about that and has probably made a ton of money in his life, uh, and as much as I want to make money in mine, the idea about sort of focusing your decisions and deciding how you want to go about building a company is having it grounded with the underpinning about make meaning. And that's been really pronounced in the way I've thought about building out Purple Carrot, about providing something that's plant-based that has all the benefits that we talked about up front, uh, that creates a meaningful opportunity to establish ourselves and do something that is inherently different from uh, a lot of the other competitors in the category. So I really love this artist's name is Hugh McLeod, and he creates something called Gaping Void. So uh, if you're not familiar with Hugh or his work, I'd encourage you to check out gapingvoid.com. And you can sign up and get this daily feed uh, of his doodles. And this one I saw several years ago, and it also stayed with me a lot, which is this idea of living on the edges or not at all. And you know, seeing that, it just it felt like it, the whole idea was to stand out and be different and be distinguished. And it's you know scary and it's exciting, um, but that's how you'll get noticed. And I, oops, sorry, I followed uh, up on that image recently to see a bit more about what he wrote about. I thought I'd read this to you. He says, just as sheep move to the center of the flock for purely survival reasons, so do human beings. It's why we wear khakis and join tennis clubs. But some of us move to the edges for the exact same reason, survival. If we stay in the middle, we're just going to get creamed like everybody else once the market moves on. I think Google is probably, probably the most innovative, edgy company out there, so I would imagine this resonates. 
Uh, but I thought that was pretty cool to see that. And again, going to that edge of providing sort of vegan food for non-vegans was the edge. Uh, people said, why don't you just offer a vegetarian option, which to me would be far more mainstream and simplistic. But all the other big guys have vegetarian options. None of them offer vegan. And so that was uh, the approach to go to the edge. So another guy who I love is a guy by the name of Seth Godin. And he's photographed here for you. And uh, Seth has um, been one of the most pronounced influences uh, in my whole life. And uh, I think he's a genius of a guy. He's written a ton of books. If you don't know Seth, uh, I really encourage you to check out sethgodin.com and sign up for his blog. You click on his bald head and uh, you can get his blog every day. And every day for years, he writes an incredible blog that you'll get in your inbox for free. And he's just a brilliant writer. He's written a lot of books and he does wonderful work. So. I uh, can't say enough great things about him, but one of the books that he's written of the 18 or 20 books or so out there is a book called Purple Cow. And Purple Cow is all about being remarkable. I think it's uh, transform your business by being remarkable as the subtext. And the storyline with Purple Cow is that, you know, if you're driving out, he was driving with his family in France, I believe, and he was going along and past this pasture and there's cows and they stop and at first they're thinking, oh, that's cool, there's these cows. and then. In a minute, it's not that interesting when there's just all these cows. And he said, imagine if you saw a purple cow. You would stop the car, you'd get out, you'd take pictures, you'd tell all your friends, and it was this idea of creating a purple cow or something that is remarkable, that forces you almost, given its remarkable nature, to tell people about it and speak to others and spread the word. So when I think about purple cow, that was sort of the genesis of the name of my company, Purple Carrot. I remember thinking about starting this company and walking down Park Avenue South in New York City one night and it just kind of hit me and I said, okay, that's the name of my vegan company, Purple Cow, Purple Carrot rather, <laughs> yeah, still slip. And uh, so it's, uh, it's been great and it's really about you know, being different. So um, I thought about, well, how could we be remarkable in our space? What can we do to stand out? Uh, what you see on the screen here is an image of, um, of me talking about one of our meals. And uh, this dish here is uh, okonomiyaki, which most people probably don't even know how to pronounce. It took me a little while to get that right for the video. Um, but the idea is that you know, it came from a, a moment that my wife and I had a few uh, months earlier where the last meal we had at home that week was called tofu halloumi. It was one of our meals uh, from Purple Carrot, and I didn't know what halloumi was, and I wasn't that excited about what that seemed like it was gonna be. And we ended up making it, and it was one of my favorite purple carrot meals I've had in three years. And I thought, God, you know, people really need to understand what our meals are, because we do have some unique and not common names to our products or to our, our recipes each week, and it, it's part of the adventure of trying plant-based meals. Okonomiyaki is no different as far as not a commonplace name. And so I felt like if I can get out there and talk about one of the three meals every week through video, post that to social, as well as uh, share that over email to our database, there might be another reason for someone who has all those choices from the number of companies that I shared with you that instead of looking at something and saying, mm, I've never heard of that, I'm not gonna take the risk of spending money on a product that's gonna make me look foolish at home, but hearing from me, or someone in my company, I was the one that they nominated to do it, so I said okay. Um, and fortunately, these have, these have um, converted at about six times the rate of our typical emails. So it's been really cool to see video and the connectivity we're building with our customer base to create a real emotional connection with them so that they feel connected to our product and that they feel a reason to stick with us and to continue to subscribe uh, and not maybe choose other options that they have on the marketplace. Something else that feels very uh, probably Google-esque that maybe has already been developed here. Um, it's something that we are looking about releasing in a Purple Carrot app that will soon to be developed that will allow people to track their impact and to create sort of a gamification system of sorts that as you use Purple Carrot, you can track and see how much water you've saved, how much carbon emissions you've reduced through your choice of meals, uh, and create sort of a competitive gamified experience from you and your friends, you know, this idea of a network effect that your product is, how can you make your product better when your friends are using it also, right? So the famous example is the first guy who bought a fax machine. I don't know what he was thinking to think who he's gonna send a fax to if nobody else had the machine. But, you know, how can you make Purple Carrot better, more interesting, more sticky to our customer base so that 
you know, if you can create this gamified approach to make you feel like you're a part of something larger than yourself by tracking your impact and seeing how this month by eating these meals as compared to more traditional meals that would be similar, you've saved you know, thousands and thousands of gallons of water. It's like you know, leaving your shower on for three months. Instead, you've eaten these meals. And so uh, ways to do that. So we're excited about what that will look like for us. We've also partnered with a guy that some of you may have seen. His name is Tom Brady. Uh, we partnered with Tom and his colleagues at TB12 back in March of this year. So we're about uh, four or five months into that partnership. Uh, it's a three-year engagement that we have with, with him. And you know, Tom is a, about an 80% plant-based eater. Uh, and he represents, to me, the absolute pinnacle of success for a human being to achieve all that he's achieved. Uh, he turns 40 next week, and he's playing at the top of his game. And he assigns a lot of value to um, the foods that he eats as a key component to his long-term success. Uh, so TB12 is all about sleep and muscle pliability and nutrition and mental energy and hydration. And so as five of those key components exist for them, Purple Carrot fit in really nicely. And when we went out and spoke with those guys uh, last fall, we talked to them about Purple Carrot and the potential to create a long-term partnership and develop the TB12 performance meals. And so we're really thrilled that uh, Tom is a partner with us. and has allowed us to create sort of a new, not, a, a new line extension from Purple Carrot. So we have our, our core meals that feed uh, two people. We have a family plan. And then now we offer these TB12 performance meals, which are gluten-free as well as plant-based and slightly higher in protein. And so it's a, another way to dif differentiate and distinguish ourselves. And through our partnership, uh, we've created, tried to take that a level deeper by offering exclusive content that takes this beyond a meal kit, but now you're really a part of the TB12 line. Um, a lot of people have signed up because they love Tom Brady. Uh, I'm one of them. But there's also a whole desire for health. And so what we've created through these TB12 newsletters is exclusive content that you can only get by being a subscriber. And so uh, every other month, we put out these, uh, these newsletters or eight pages. They are all designed in-house. This is an example of one of the spreads that shows you know, various summer produce, different sauces that uh, Tom might enjoy, and things that are consistent with that. Uh, we've featured 24 hours with Tom. We've got questions with Tom. We've got sort of behind the scenes content that you're just not going to get anywhere else. And again, that's sort of an exclusive piece of uh, the way we can uh, merchandise and make the most of this partnership. We also have uh, the nice opportunity to send our subscribers a letter from Tom. You see that in the far left side with a little bit of a creepy guy who's there holding the image of Tom. And then on the right, it's actually a real um, autographed binder uh, that Tom signed 12 of these. Everything he does is in the 12 number, um, as you can imagine, with the number 12. And so what we did is uh, when you order our, uh, our product after your 12th box has arrived, after three months, you'll get a wooden binder that's got this TB12 etching in it with the performance meals. And it's a three ring binder that uh, where you can con uh, retain and organize the recipe cards that we ship that are also three-hole punched. And so 12 lucky people received an autographed uh, Tom Brady binder. And people post on social. And it, you know, it just allows us to do things that really no other meal kit can do. Uh, so we feel pretty good about where we're headed there. And um, you know, it sort of comes down to this image when I think about the sea of choices and what's out there. How can we stand out? And how can you take all these choices and say, I'm, I'm the guy that they're going to pick? Um, and so uh, that's what drives me to try to do that. I'll leave you with this last image from uh, Hugh that I love. And it just really spoke to me in a lot of the words that he shared uh, when he posted this image about, you know, you try so hard and you're scared. You wake up in the middle of the night. You've got a pain in your side. And you just do it because you love it and you believe in the future. And so this idea of I love this and it's terrifying. And I can tell you it is terrifying. <laughs> it's a thrill. It's an honor to do what I do. Uh, and I'm just looking to make a difference, and uh, hopefully we're succeeding. So uh, thank you so much for uh, listening. You can get in touch with me with that information there, and I'm happy to take any questions from anyone here or remotely. So thank you so much. I was curious about like big food lobbying, and like I'm sure, I mean, obviously lobbyists have a big influence on like policies that encourage 
meat consumption and yeah. how much meat we sell in our grocery stores and advertisements for cool steaks and on the grill and yeah. all of that stuff. So like, do you like, is there a way to like f- combat that? Cause like, I would like to see more companies like this advertised and like senators fighting for plant-based meals in public schools, stuff like that. Like, yeah. are there any like things we could do to like scale this quickly or? Thank you. Uh, I love the support. Uh, you know, we just watched a documentary about two weeks ago called What the Health. Uh, I'm not sure if you've seen it yet, but uh, it's really worth checking out. Um, it, it really highlights the inherent conflict that exists between big food and our government and the presentation of, of meals and the recommendations that are made uh, and, and also with um, health advocacy groups with, within the pharmaceutical world, it was really concerning to see the, um, this misalignment of incentives where you know, the American Diabetes Association or the American Heart Association, which one would think as a consumer you could rely upon for good guidance, and, and you start to see the amount of money and the funding that comes in from big industry. So whether that's the pharmaceutical companies or the large food manufacturers, you know, candy companies, meat companies, dairy companies, the works, there's, they're all part of that. And you know, their goal is to further perpetuate the consumption of the foods and the products that they create and provide, and there's that inherent misalignment. So you know, I think it's a big task to um, sort of fight big government. I think documentaries like What the Health do a really nice job of shining that bright light. Um, and I think it's, you know, there's a bumper sticker that says, you know, when the, when the, when the people lead, the leaders will follow, something like that. You know, that it's that idea that I think we have to start acting together. It talks about, you know, what I said at the beginning. This our world is, you know, on pretty precarious grounds, um, and I think as more people start to make those changes, it doesn't seem weird anymore to think about eating plant-based. And you know, amazed out here in California how much choice there is and how con- how aware that is, and and um, it's not everywhere like that, right? And so I think the more it becomes more mainstream, the more you see the growth of plant-based searches, uh, the more leaders get involved. And I think the more change that you know, comes through a younger uh, generation of millennials who are the you know, very large cohort who also are the ones that are most interested in transparency, in you know, meat and dairy replacements, that that's gonna start shifting uh, policies that will enable more of us to succeed through this, so. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, So my question is about how you source your recipes. Um, Mm -hmm. I've been like preparing plant-based meals probably for about a year and a half, um, and I've done several purple carrot recipes, and I find that um, they're, are very unique compared to a lot of the things you find on the internet in terms of like the ways that you yeah. can create like really interesting things. So for example, there was a recipe where like you made scallops out of mushrooms, mushrooms. Um, yeah. which was really awesome and tasted great. Um, so I, yeah, I'm just wondering like where these ideas come from and like who's working on the, the recipes themselves. Sure. So by and large, all the recipes that we make at Purple Carrot come from our own chefs. We have on staff, so back in, we're, we're based in the Boston area, we've got about 30 employees uh, on staff full time. Uh, two of those are chefs, and we got a couple other sort of sous chefs and assistants to help you know, order uh, products for them to be testing in our test kitchen uh, back in Boston. We do outsource our fulfillment, and we have that happening in three centers in New York, LA, and Ohio. Um, so our, our corporate offices, if you will, they're not that corporate, but uh, the corporate office uh, houses these 30 folks. And uh, we have a test kitchen. And so our, our chefs are, are just singularly focused on creating incredible plant-based meals. We have parameters by which they need to stay uh, from both the like, cost of the meals and the cost of the ingredients, uh, the time it's going to take to make a dish. Um, some of the, you know, we try not to have more than one of the three meals every week require a food processor just to find the balance, not make them too complex, which we tend to be a little bit more chefy than maybe I would like. But, uh, it is that experience, but the flavors, you know, it's, I really have to just, you know, um, applaud the work that our chefs do to create incredible things. The, um, the mushroom dish that you mentioned though comes from, 
couple of friends of mine who run a company called Wicked Healthy, uh, Derek and Chad Sarno, who are really incredible vegan chefs. And uh, yeah, they take these king oyster mushrooms and you, they taste and feel like scallops. They're incredible. Um, and so you'd never know that, you know, for someone who wants to make those transition from eating uh, sort of a more traditional diet to one that's more plant-based, how, um, how far things have come. And with innovation using oyster mushrooms that you slice and you saute a bit, uh, it looks, it tastes, it feels like, uh, like a scallop. So um, it's cool. But there's, um, I think there's a, a, what we try to do is make our meals taste so good that you don't miss the meat, you don't miss those flavors. Um, and again, we're trying to get someone to do that three nights a week. We're not saying be vegan. Uh, as I said, I'm not vegan. I don't preach veganism through our company. And I think that's, you know, that's got to be someone's personal choice. For the majority of people that aren't choosing that, I think if you start eating this three nights a week, you might say, wow, that's actually really good. And you, you almost become more inclined to watch the documentaries, to start seeing things. And not so much in terms of the shocking, horrible animal treatment that exists that I think a lot of us you know, stick our head in the sand and don't want to pay attention to that animal suffering. And we don't ever talk about that within our company. I think that's a hard thing to trade upon. But I think for those people that start to get curious about it and learn more, uh, you begin, that starts to seep in. And you know, once the genie's out of the bottle, it's hard to put it back in. Um, and so if we can just get people to make some gentle shifts over time uh, without saying, hey, everybody's got to go be vegan, that, I think that's unsustainable. But if we can all make some subtle changes in our diet, the impact we can make collectively is really quite pronounced. Hi, thank you so much. Um, my name is Alex. I work on Google Express, and we try to connect people to their local stores like Target and Costco. Mm -hmm. And um, in doing so, we notice that when competing with Amazon, these local stores uh, struggle on the operation side and the shipping. And how does Purple Carrot um, deal with that? Uh, take it a little bit deeper from the operations of just shipping to our customers or? Shipping to the customers and getting things within the you know two days or fast delivery that other meal kit companies have also struggled with. Sure, okay, thank you for the question. So um, when I first launched the company, we were started in my garage for the first month and then uh, we moved into a slightly more proper facility but it was not so proper and uh, we had no heat through that winter. We, we launched in October, so November we were in this facility. By December it was starting to snow in Boston, and it was just bloody cold for the next 90 days, and a lot of snow that winter. And we were in this warehouse with no heat, and you know our product was, we weren't so worried about it losing freshness, but we were limiting it to one and two day ground shipping with a FedEx truck. Um, we use insulation and gel packs, and um, the produce would hold up. We were learning that you know basil might wilt; uh, it almost gets too cold, and it would turn black, and it would perish. Um, as we moved into the summer with no air conditioning either, uh, and we were in this warehouse that was just like 90 degrees, it was miserable. Those products would also start to wilt in the heat, so that wasn't. You know, we sort of quickly got ourselves out of that as we realized that was not working so well. Uh, where in the box it would still be a lot of you know, four gel packs and thick insulation, um, and again, limiting it to one or two day ground shipping was sort of key for us that in our test that we never wanted to go longer than that in the box. By November of 2015, about one year after I launched, we opened up a West Coast distribution center, and we moved out of our facilities into also a more proper place that was a cold room that we were packing our product in cold. Um, and so from both distribution centers in Boston and LA, they were always at, you know, packed in uh, cold rooms and then packed into boxes with insulation and gel packs, limiting it to one and two day ground shipping. Uh, we then moved our Boston facility to New York for broader reach and a bit more efficiency. Uh, we've just opened up a third distribution center in Ohio. And so now we have 100% coverage in the continental US with one or two day ground shipping. Uh, there are some customers that we need to do a two day air uh, which we don't want to be doing, and we're moving to move that third facility to have the capacity to get everyone meals within one or two days from when they ship uh, with a truck rather than using a, an airplane. Um, you know, the downside to that is the requirement on insulation. Um, we have had some learnings and experiences where we had a certain thickness to our boxes, and just this summer we went through a problem where we had some insulation that was we needed to add more gel packs to keep it cold because the insulation was failing. 
So that was sort of a whole separate story with our supplier that caused me some gray hair in my head to add to what's there already. And putting more gel packs in then started to compromise the integrity of the box. And so you'd, people would get boxes that were beat up and the box would, would compress under the weight of the added gel packs and the gel packs were melting faster because there wasn't the insulation. So it becomes sort of a snowball effect and we were able to quickly shift to a thicker box and that issue has gone away and we changed the liners. But you know, it's a, it's a really, the, the amount of complexity that I think happens in the meal kit space is really pronounced and to get incredibly fresh and incredibly fragile produce a lot of times, especially in a plant-based meal kit where we're not relying on you know, chicken or beef or other animal protein as the source, we're really having to bulk up on, on great vegetables and grains that some of that stuff is really fragile and also hard to source. So it can be complex if you are sourcing you know, a watermelon radish. Well, we had issues where the watermelon radish was too big and it was supposed to meet spec, but the suppliers couldn't get us the smaller watermelon radishes. Now you have a big watermelon radish, it's gonna throw the flavor, so then you have to go and cut the watermelon radish in half, and that, you know, that worked because there was stability to that product, and onion wouldn't hold up nearly as well, if at all. Um, so there's, there's decisions that we have to make every single week, sort of throughout the week, based on what the supply chain enables us to access. And you know, I think what Blue Apron's done to control a lot of the supply chain is brilliant, because they should have sort of the best pick of the produce and suppliers are growing things just for them. So that should enable them to avoid some of those uh, challenges that we face as a smaller company. Um, but getting it to someone in a really fresh manner is certainly the most important piece. And when our suppliers like a FedEx or OnTrack deliver, sometimes they miss and, you know, but we have to own that. So we can't go back to the customer and say, sorry, OnTrack messed up this week we have to then take that and either refund them or give them credit. So it's a, you know, it's challenging, but I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I have some of a related question on packaging. So sure. one of the common criticisms of meal kits is that it involves a lot of packaging. And that's one of the things that's given me pause about trying it out. Yep. Um, so I'm just curious, like, how do you think about environmental sustainability in your packaging? and? I work in finance, so I'm always curious about the numbers. Like, do you know how much the impact of packaging and transport, how does that offset the environmental benefits accrued from actually eating a plant-based diet? Sure. Yeah, we're actually starting to study the, that exact issue. Um, what I can tell you is we're very aware of the, of the challenge with insulation. Uh, I'd say by and large, it is the single largest complaint against meal kits is how much packaging and insulation goes in to get the customer their relatively small amount of food as compared to the size of the box that is being shipped. Um, we have moved over time from sort of more standard insulation to recyclable insulation. Uh, we were, through the spring, we were using the first 100% uh, curbside recyclable insulation. Um, and we're now into, we, we then now use a, um, a recycled insulation that's made from water bottles that's been recycled down from that that is then further recyclable. Um, all of our boxes are recyclable, the baggies, the bottles, everything can be recycled. So we do our best to minimize that uh, impact. And I think broadly speaking, the industry is aware of that and more and more companies are helping consumers get comfortable with that idea that you can at least recycle the product that, that is being shipped to you from the, the, what's required to get you those fresh items. Um, but it's, you know, as a plant-based company, which has a big connection to environmental sustainability, it's incumbent upon us, I believe, as a company to have the words match our actions or the actions match our words uh, so that we're continuing to innovate. Um, I'm pleased with what we've accomplished in a relatively short period of time. I think the gel packs is a piece that like we were looking about taking frozen water bottles and using that. So you put frozen water bottles into the packing and let that cool the produce that is in there. Then you can you know, drink your water bottles, recycle the water bottle, and you've got really zero impact as compared to the gel packs that many people have a little discomfort about having to either squeeze those out or throw them away. It feels like a lot, especially if you order on a regular basis, they build up. You feel like, my God, what am I doing with all these? Um, so it's, it's no doubt a challenge. I think you know, if people factor in the gas that they're using to drive to the grocery store. And also you think about 
the amount of impact that grocers have with respect to receiving you know, truckloads of groceries that come in. There's a massive amount of you know, sort of violation, if you will, that happens at the grocery level that I think people forget about and assign all of that to the meal kit. And so it's, you know, I think it's the reality that we have about uh, the impact we make, but I think that there's also a relative falsehood that it's the carbon emission that happens from transportation that is so big when in fact it's the animal agriculture that's even bigger than that. So hopefully we can move people in that direction. Yeah. Okay. Um, so do you have any advice for young entrepreneurs and how did your time at NYU Stern and in sales impact your career? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so if you're a young entrepreneur, I would uh, I'd build on what I said already about um, following Seth Godin and reading his teachings. I would uh, drink up every single thing that you can on that. Uh, and Guy Kawasaki is a great resource as well. Um, Gary Vee is a pretty, um, he, he's, he's out there with what he says. He's got a particular style, but he's uh, all about entrepreneurship as well. Um, I think more than anything, though, it's having the courage and confidence to take the leap and not wait for the perfect moment, because there's never a better time than right now to start your company. Uh, what people have, the resources that are available today than was available last year or five years ago or 15 or 20 years ago certainly is incredible and you don't need permission to start, you just have to have the guts to do it. Um, and you know, access to capital is so much easier today than it's ever been before. Uh, you can publish on your own, you don't need permission to do that. Um, and the economy is supportive of startups. And so I think the idea of uh, being able to create, create a business and you know, using tools like Slack that enables you to be you know, uh, disconnected from your people from a proximity perspective, but stay connected, uh, the tools that are available to build websites you know, in rapid fashion, uh, the, the opportunities are right in front of you. And it's, it feels great to try to make a difference and to test yourself every day with that and uh, give yourself a challenge that is so different than working in corporate America with all due respect to corporate America where I, I spent you know, a fair bit of my career. Um, but it, it's great and once you get the bug, you'll never go back. Um, and I don't think I could ever work again in corporate America and never plan to. Um, and I think for those young entrepreneurs that are thinking about that, uh, to do it and to just play the long game and know when you've got to quit that uh, if it's not working so that you have the chance to try the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and hopefully you make some money along the way and you can then roll that into your next, uh, next approach. You know, NYU was, um, it was five years of a lot of pain. It cost me a lot of money. It cost me a lot of my time. The fact that I have an MBA, I don't think it really mattered. I, I have to say, I, I wish I could think differently about it. I think those who go full-time have a much different experience. I went part-time and went from 7 to 10 p.m. for classes most nights for five years, and that was uh, really draining. And I don't think I had the best teachers at those hours. Uh, so I think someone thinking about an MBA should do it full time and go all in instead of doing it like me, which was squeezing it in while I worked. Um, and sales is just a great uh, tool to be able to know how to sell, and whether you're selling a product or you're selling an idea, whether you're trying to convince your spouse you know, where to go on vacation or you know, tell your kids what food to eat, it's, it's all sales at the end of the day. And so uh, being able to sell ice to Eskimos or anywhere in between uh, is a really important tool and a skill that I encourage for anybody. Then on a related note, um, aside from meal kit delivery services, what other opportunities for entrepreneurship do you see in the plant-based space? So, um, you know, there's plant-based space is growing by leaps and bounds, and it's projected to grow from about a $13 billion industry to a $25 billion industry in the next five years. Uh, so there's a lot of growth there. I think, you know, product development is a huge area of, of innovation um, to think about educating people with, uh, you know, different types of products that are plant-based. Um, you know, the, I think the area of education is, is, um, is a great opportunity, whether it's like teaching people how to cook plant-based or um, uh, even providing services to help people become more plant-based and sort of be someone's sort of chaperoned through a, through a process. Um, there's probably interesting innovation opportunities uh, there. Uh, 
but I would also not encourage, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to be an entrepreneur just in the plant-based space. I mean, the plant-based space, I think, is really cool, and I love what I'm doing and the difference that I make by being in a plant-based space versus selling or trying to promote other things. Um, but I would say if someone's interested in plant-based, a great thing is go to um, Expo East or Expo West. Expo West is in Anaheim. Expo East is in Baltimore. Those conferences happen twice a year. It's, it will open your eyes up to the incredible uh, growth of the category and the number of products that are uh, servicing those people who care about uh, health and wellness uh, through the foods and choices that they make. So that would be worth going to. All right. Thank you. Do you have another question? Oh, no. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Thanks so much.